This is Global Tennessee, news analysis and commentary from the Tennessee World Affairs Council in Nashville. Global Tennessee is produced in association with the Center for International Business at Belmont University and the International Business Council of the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. The World Affairs Council is a nonpartisan, nonprofit educational association, and the views expressed on Global Tennessee are those of the participants. Welcome to Global Dialogue. I'm Patrick Ryan from the Tennessee World Affairs Council. This is a uh, World Affairs Council global awareness uh, program that connects you with international affairs distinguished speakers. During the social distancing period of the pandemic response to the uh, uh, the crisis we're going through, the World Affairs Council has pivoted its speaker program, usually presented in person at Belmont University, to the now popular Zoom webinar technology. I invite you to check out our other webinar programs, a Tuesday afternoon program on current affairs with Ambassador Dick Bowers and myself, and Global National with Carl Dean, which will alternate on Tuesdays with this speaker's program. Uh, next week, Mayor Dean will be talking with Sean Henry, President and CEO of the Nashville Predators, and a businessman who has his pulse on what's happening in Nashville. They might even talk a little hockey. You can check out our website, tnwac.org, for the calendar of guests. Also, make sure you're on our email newsletter list. You can sign up for that on tnwac.org, our homepage. That's how to keep up with everything going on. If you're enjoying us uh, this evening on Facebook Live, welcome. We hope uh, you uh, find this presentation useful. Uh, and please uh, send your questions uh, via Twitter to at TNWAC. If you're here with us on uh, Zoom, uh, you can tap the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Uh, please start sending your questions at any time. Uh, let me introduce my guest uh, this evening for Global Dialogue, uh, David Desroches. He's an associate professor at the Near East South Asia Center, or NISA, at the National Defense University in Washington. More than that, he is among the small group of specialists on the Middle East who you can rely upon for expert insights and perspectives on what's going on in that region. Uh, David is a retired career U.S. Army officer, having attained the rank of colonel. He is a West Point grad, a combat veteran, and an Army Ranger. And he spent a lot of time jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. Apart from being an Anaheim Ducks fan, uh, Dave and I have gotten to be friends for an unknown number of years, having gotten acquainted on the conference circuit in Washington. Uh, mostly Dave up front on the panels and me in the back in the, of the room listening and learning. Uh, the World Affairs Council has had the privilege of hosting uh, Professor DeRoche here in Nashville previously as part of our Distinguished Visitor Speaking Program, and we're fortunate to have him back uh, with us tonight. Dave, uh, welcome back to Nashville, at least virtually. Thanks. I wish I were there for real. It's uh, it's a lovely city, and I had a great time. Well, the, the streets are a little empty, as uh, I'm sure they are in, in your neck of the woods, but uh, hopefully we'll be uh, back to normal before long. Uh, we're going to start off the program with uh, a tour de raison of the, uh, the Middle East region. Uh, we'll follow with a conversation about current developments in the Middle East, and then we'll take your questions. Uh, you can add them to the question queue on your screen at any time. Uh, Professor DeRoche is uh, world famous for his terrific uh, briefing slides, uh, so you're about to get entertained and more importantly informed. Dave, the uh, floor is yours. Well, thank you. If you could uh, put up my world famous briefing slide, number one, I'd appreciate it. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I wish I were there, as I said, in person, but uh, you know, hopefully this will uh, inform and enlighten some of you. I have to say at the outset that uh, uh, while I'm paid by the U.S. government, I don't speak for it. So uh, I can be open, frank, and honest. Uh, my Twitter and my Facebook are there. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I, I tweet uh, reports, uh, documents, government uh, information. Now, there's a lot of developments in the Middle East that uh, are worthy of discussion, but I figured that it would be best to focus on two things that seem to be really in the forefront right now, uh, oil and authoritarianism. Uh, in the question and answer, if you want to talk about Iran, the U.S. Uh, uh, confrontation with Iran, uh, the uh, imploding states of Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, uh, Iran, again, uh, weapons sales, uh, the uh, Israel-Palestine, whatever it is that you're interested in, I'll be happy to address that in the questions. But uh, oil and authoritarianism kind of seem to be at the front right now. So let me, uh, you know, indulge me for a few minutes and we'll set that off as sort of the, the jumping off point for a conversation. Next slide, please. So first, oil. Next slide. 
So this is a map of proved oil reserves or proven oil reserves in the world. And there's a couple things that the average American is unaware of. First off, uh, if you ask the man in the street which country has the greatest proved oil reserves, they would probably say Saudi Arabia, maybe Iran, maybe Iraq. But the real answer is Venezuela. You'll also notice that number three in terms of proved reserves is Canada. Um, so why do we focus on the Middle East? Well, there's a difference between having a lot of oil and having oil that is cheap, easy to extract and convert into a, a form that can be easily turned into gasoline or petroleum fuel stocks. Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world. And uh, indeed, Venezuela was the driving company, the driving force behind the creation of OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, not the Arab countries. However, most of its oil is uh, very high sulfur content. Uh, they have a lot of it, but it has to go through a lot of refining to get into a usable form. It's difficult to transport. And so it's just not as desirable as the sort of light, sweet, what they call sweet oil that requires minimal refinery that you get in the uh, Gulf, that you get uh, in the North Sea, and that you get in West Texas. Canada also has a lot of oil, but quite a bit of it is again uh, in the form of tar sands or it has a heavy sulfur content. And indeed, there's a debate in Canada as to whether this you know, oil should be extracted, not only because it's very expensive to extract, but also because of the uh, propensity for environmental damage. But in the Gulf with Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, um, again, minimal drilling, minimal extraction. Uh, to get it. The United States, their oil reserves, uh, we've always had significant oil reserves, but lately we've become uh, huge at this because of developments in hydraulic fracturing or fracking and horizontal drilling. And again, um, that requires a lot of effort and it's much more expensive to actually get the oil out of the ground. So the Middle East remains supreme, not necessarily because they have the highest oil reserves, although they have high oil reserves, but also because it's cheap and easy to get it out of the ground, transport it, and convert it into a usable form. Next slide. The proof of that is when you look at oil exports. And here you kind of get what people uh, would expect to see. The number one oil exporting nation is Saudi Arabia. Number two is Russia exporting that mostly to Western Europe through existing networks of pipelines. Number three is Iraq. Again, that's to be expected. But here's an odd one. Number four is the USA and number five is Canada. Now, um, why is that? Well, again, we've spoken about the um, developments in hydraulic fracturing, things of that nature. Uh, even though there are large numbers of exports, most of the US oil exports and Canadian exports is back and forth across the US-Canada border from the United States to Mexico and back again. Um, Canada is trying, is considering getting their oil out of Canada and exporting it to Asia. The major oil importer is China, not the United States. But uh, you know the, the, the problem that Canada uh, Russia and to a lesser extent the United States has is that its oil is is significantly inland and again it has to go through uh, a lot of transport to get there so you'll recall there were protests in South Dakota over the Keystone pipeline that was going to cut across uh, half of almost all of America cutting America in half just to get Canadian oil uh, to a refinery into a place where it can be brought to market so again the Middle East which has pipelines or oil fields in close proximity to oceans where th things could be refined, loaded up on tankers and exported, has a significant market advantage that really is going to be hard to overcome. And that's why you see uh, so many of these countries in the top 10 are in the Middle East. Next slide, please. This shows the uh, Persian Gulf or the Arabian Gulf, depending on who you want to offend. Uh, the black shows oil fields, the red shows natural gas fields. And uh, you can see that there are some fields that are commingled. Um, of particular note, if you look uh, in Saudi Arabia, right where it says Dahran in blue, there's this long oil field that also has a red border around it. So it has both oil and natural gas. That is one of the largest oil fields in the world. That's where oil was originally discovered in Saudi Arabia in 1937 and continues to uh, be uh, one of the highest production oil fields in the world. And that's really the source of the wealth of Saudi Arabia. Qatar, to its right, has that big red field. Uh, that's the natural gas field, and that's one of the richest natural gas deposits in, in the world. This is an older map. That field is actually a lot bigger. But you note that there's a border between that, and Qatar shares that oil field 
with Iran. So they're required to kind of interact with Iran. Um, this has led to tension between Qatar and its neighbor, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain. But the bottom line is there's a lot of oil there. But as you can see, it's all located relatively close to coasts. And so this uh, enables it to be easier to refine and export and transport. Uh, and it's also a relatively high grade oil when you compare it to uh, particularly tar sands in Canada, which are incredibly difficult to extract, and the uh, high sulfur oil that we see in Venezuela, which has much larger reserves, or the interior oil in Russia that has to transit thousands of miles over land to get to market. Next slide, please. Now, something happened yesterday in the oil market, and the graph on the top shows it. Uh, this was the price for West Texas Intermediate, which is the benchmark American grade of oil. And uh, it actually went to the point where uh, it was in negative price. At the end of the market day yesterday, you did not buy oil. You um, paid somebody, uh, it was $40 a barrel, to take oil off your hands. Why is this the case? Is, does this reflect an oil crisis? Well, to a certain extent it does. It reflects a precipitous drop in demand for oil due to the COVID-19 virus. I mean, how many of you have had to refuel your gas, you know, your car tank in the last three weeks? I usually do it once a week. I've done it once this month. Um, but this doesn't, and, and there is a glut of oil. There is a relative surplus of oil. But what this really reflects is the fact that this is the market for oil futures and oil futures come due today. So yesterday was the last day of trading. Most of the people who traded in oil futures never actually physically owned a barrel of oil. What they would do is speculate on selling futures and then you have to settle it uh, today. And what happened was as these futures markets were going, these people, most of whom, as I said, have never actually owned oil, realized that they couldn't find buyers at the price they expected. And the sales had to be um, concluded in Cushing, Oklahoma. That's the center of America's oil industry. And uh, it's just storage is full up in Cushing. And so they wound up having to pay people to take their oil. Now, will the price stay in negative ground or low ground indefinitely? No. The, um, the June trading started and it was at about $20 a barrel. Uh, so. This was kind of a one-off and it's more of a speculation deal. Uh, for those who are of a certain age, if you remember the movie Trading Places, uh, when Eddie Murray and uh, Dan Aykroyd managed to bamboozle uh, their aged employers, the Duke brothers, uh, Don Amici and Ralph Bellamy, into uh, going long on frozen concentrated orange juice and bankrupted them. That's kind of what happened here. The picture at the bottom, however, there is still a fundamental glut in supply. And the picture in the bottom shows an oil tanker uh, off the coast of Louisiana. Uh, in the last couple of months, Saudi Arabia was determined to flood the market to cause Russia to uh, agree to price supports. And also they wanted to lower the cost of production to drive American high cost producers, to a lesser extent Canadian high cost producers out of business. So they chartered a huge number of oil tankers and just sent them uh, towards the United States. And uh, there are several of these. So, you know, there will be um, s excess supply. Uh, the, the price of oil will be lower than the price of extracting oil from American wells in the near future. Uh, the Saudi aim is to, you know, they're tired of holding back on production in order for oil prices to rise and then seeing American producers coming in taking advantage of their market discipline. So they're trying to drive them out of the market. However, next slide, um, this, this reflects a little bit of a, a miscalculation that I'll get into later. So let's talk about the relationship of the United States and uh, oil in Saudi Arabia. Uh, these four pictures kind of tell the story, I think. The aircraft is an Italian SM-82 bomber. Uh, in 1943, uh, four of these bombers set off from Crete to bomb the British uh, oil fields in Bahrain. They, it was an incredibly long air trip for World War II. They went from Crete all the way across the Mediterranean, across the Middle East, bombed Bahrain, and then managed to return and land in Eritrea in Africa. One of the four got lost and bombed the uh, American-owned Saudi Aramco, or then called Aramco oil field in Dahran. And the owners of uh, Ramco of what was then called Caltex or Ramco, which was 
uh, Texaco and Standard Oil of California, went to the U.S. government and said, we need to have U.S. Army troops to protect our oil, our American oil investments, or failing that, we need to be made, uh, you know, brought into the U.S. military service and armed, as happened with uh, Pan American Airways at Wake Island. And the United States government said, thank you for your interest in national security. Oil is not, oil in Saudi Arabia is not a vital interest of the United States at this point. We had enough oil from elsewhere. Uh, and it was interesting that an American company was making money there, but it was a time of war and it just wasn't seen to be important enough to defend. Going clockwise, the next picture, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Colonel William Eddy, and uh, Ibn Saud, the, uh, the great king of Saudi Arabia. This is their meeting on the USS Quincy and the Great uh, Bitter Lake in 1945 on Valentine's Day. Um, they got together and talked. This was the first time an American president had met a king uh, in, in the Arabian world, in the Middle East. And uh, they talked about a number of issues. They talked about what the post-World War II settlement would look like. They talked about the possibility of providing a national home for uh, Jewish refugees uh, fleeing oppression in Europe. One subject they did not discuss at all was oil. So again, that was kind of a marginal uh, concern. It was a commercial interest, but it wasn't viewed as a strategic interest. Beneath that is when it became a strategic interest. This is a picture of gas shortages in the 1973 oil crush. And we had two uh, events that happened at the same time. The first was American demand for oil, in spite of a robust domestic production, our consumption increased at these drastic rates because look at the size of the cars you see there. Um, our demand for oil increased at the same time that we had an Arab-Israeli war and the uh, Arab countries stopped oil shipments. And for the first time, they realized that they had uh, the ability to affect our economy. Now, in the wake of the 73 war, something very unusual and very rarely remarked upon happened. And that was that an agreement was struck for Saudi Arabia to nationalize the American owned uh, Aramco oil company. And that's what the final picture shows is one of the large Aramco refineries uh, in the Dahran area. And it's really unusual when you consider the value of Aramco, which is probably on a dollar for dollar basis, the richest company in the world. It had been America within seven years in a totally amicable process without any rancor or threat of uh, going to war or anything like that. It was completely nationalized by Saudi Arabia. Recall Mohammed Mossadegh, uh, you know, the reason why the British with American support overthrew him as prime minister of Iran in the 1950s was because he nationalized the British oil companies operating in Iran. And, uh, you know, the United States and Mexico uh, almost went to war in the 30s when Mexico nationalized American oil facilities. But the fact that this nationalization was conducted amicably really shows that, you know, there's a little bit more cooperation. It's more than just uh, they've got oil, we want it. It shows that there's uh, something else to it. Next slide, please. This shows, uh, the top chart shows the um, price of oil or the oil production in Saudi Arabia. And then the red uh, price shows uh, Brent crude oil price, the global price. Brent crude is kind of the global benchmark. West Texas Intermediate is the American benchmark. Uh, Brent is usually about two to three dollars a barrel more than this. And what you can see is that Saudi oil production tended with the exception of the decade of the 1990s and 2000s, tends to rise and fall. It correlates roughly with um, the price of oil. So, you know, if oil is down, sometimes they raise production uh, and try to, uh, you know, just they need money. But generally, um, what you see is that they produce when they can. And they have the ability, uniquely among major uh, oil producing countries, they are the swing producer. They can, they can move up by millions of barrels a day, and they can move down by millions of barrels today. The bottom chart goes from 1945 to 1916, I'm sorry, 1949. And what it shows is American exports for oil. So, um, imports and exports. So below the zero line, everything in the sort of dark brown there, um, those are imports of oil. And then you see that, you know, in spite of American production, which uh, starts to take off in the 19, late 1970s in the wake of the oil uh, crisis, you see American production rising through the 2000s as a result of improvements in 
hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling and to the point that the black line, which is the net, does America export or import oil, shows that by about the 2010s, the United States actually became a net oil exporter. So the United States uh, relationship with Saudi Arabia is not one of, you know, they need oil, and we've got to take it. It's more like we both have vigorous oil uh, markets and we, we need to uh, find a way to, to work together in that. Next slide, please. These two charts are very interesting. And these, I think, show the, the upper left-hand chart shows uh, is what drives the, the Saudi uh, motive to flood the market. And the bottom kind of shows why I think that ultimately will not work. So what the upper shows is how many Americans involved in oil services and uh, drilling and production, how many of them go bankrupt. And basically, you can see bankruptcies increasing steadily from 2018 to 2019. And of course, this was before Saudi Arabia flooded uh, the oil market before you got this um, glut on oil at Cushing, Oklahoma. Um, <coughs> typically, it costs more to extract the oil from a, an American oil field. It, it, I've heard estimates that range from $20 a barrel to about $40 a barrel. So if oil is selling at $20 a barrel, you can't make money. Also, <coughs> a lot of American producers have borrowed money at high rates to uh, finance their operations. So they need to have an even higher uh, price per barrel in order to break a profit, say $60 or $80. The Saudi government budget, in order for it to balance, oil needs to be $80 a barrel. So it seems as though what the Saudis did this year when they decided to flood the market was they wanted part of it was to bring Russia to the table and come to agreement, but part of it was to drive these guys out of business. So what they did was, you know, they looked at these numbers and said, okay, let's put that through the top and kill the American uh, uh, frackers who they view as sort of um, almost uh, uh, economic parasites in that they take advantage of Saudi efforts to keep the, to support the price. Now the chart in the lower right-hand corner is why I think this won't work. This shows wells that are drilled but uncompleted. Um, so these are these new wells in the United States. And you can see that there's typically thousands of them. I think it's about 6,000 of them um, that are ready to go. And with hydraulic fracturing with these new American oil wells, in the old days, it took five years to drill an oil well. These wells that are drilled but un uncompleted, if the price of oil rises to a value, that makes it economically feasible to recover. These could go into service in as quickly as two weeks. The second miscalculation by Saudi Arabia is that they don't have bankruptcy laws in Saudi Arabia. If you have a business and you can't pay your debts, uh, you suffer great personal shame, you have to sell your assets. Uh, but this idea that, you, that somehow you get protection from your creditors, you pay pennies on the dollar, you're able to reincorporate as a growing concern, that doesn't exist in Saudi Arabia or in much of the Arab world. Um, so basically, you know, you can see hotels that are completed from the outside, but vacant on the inside because the owners run out of money. Um, that doesn't happen in the United States. And so the assumption is that if they drive these guys out of business, they'll stay out of business. But what actually will happen is not that these wells are blown up or burnt or anything like that. What happens is that the equipment that they bought at great expense and that the debt service that they had done, that gets wiped out. They get wiped out of business. But then that $100 drilling equipment gets sold at a bankruptcy auction for $20 or $10. And the wells can go back into business with a new operator who's acquired this at a bankruptcy sale who doesn't need $60 a barrel oil to make a profit. He can now make a profit at $20 a barrel. So individual operators will go out of business, but there is the potential for the, biz, for the industry to reestablish itself and it will establish itself at a lower rate of profit required in order to break even. So I think the Saudi effort in the long run has a very good chance of being counterproductive. Next slide, please. Now, why does Saudi Arabia do this? Well, they need money for Vision 2030 build. Vision 2030 is a, if you hit next slide, it'll build. Um, Vision 2030, is their comprehensive uh, development plan, I, I'm sorry, you gotta hit it again, uh, that is encompassing, it wants to bring Saudi Arabia into the modern world and make it a country in which everybody works, subsidies are eliminated, people are responsible for their own life, their own happiness, their own wealth, and the economy 
builds things. It's diversified. It's not just petroleum. It's based on things like tourism and uh, uh, manufacturing, travel, uh, information services, things of that nature. It is a national plan for a rebuilding. It's, it's kind of the capitalist equivalent of what Stalin was trying to do in the old Soviet Union. It's a, it's a, it's a fundamental transformation. It takes a lot of money. And in the short term, that money has to come from oil. So Saudi Arabia is taking a short term hit to their own prices and their own interests, I think, in order to generate uh, the income needed for this modernization. So that's it for oil, and I'll welcome your questions later on. Let's take a look at authoritarianism. Next slide. Next slide. So when you look at the 20th century, and we're kind of in the extension of the 20th century, just as the uh, 19th century ran from uh, uh, the wars of Napoleon pretty much to the uh, fields of the Somme, the 20th century is sort of a phenomena that really uh, starts at Versailles and has yet to kind of come to a close. And uh, the principles that guided it were first, uh, the man on the upper left-hand corner, Woodrow Wilson, with his 14 points, the idea of national self-determination, that uh, nation states should be countries. That kind of set the tone for uh, political discourse. It was countered by a communist vision, represented there at the bottom by Nikita Khrushchev with John F. Kennedy. Uh, but basically, um, uh, the, the liberal kind of American-driven order, um, that's the one that kind of prospered. And you can see that it was refined by Franklin Roosevelt in World War II, who had the uh, four freedoms that are there on that postage stamp. Um, now, even in the times of the Cold War, you know, when Kennedy and Khrushchev got together, they didn't really disagree on the goals that people should be able to, you know, do what they want, live how they want not live in squalor and fear. What they argued over was which system was better able to deliver that. And so, you know, the communists would say, well, you know, yes, you know, you have some people who get ahead, but, you know, you have people sleeping in the streets in New York City. So even though there were radically different systems, there was a great degree of comedy over the aims of the systems. Next slide, please. Now, in the course of that long 20th century, the United States and, and various presidents, you know, made, you know, we had to ally ourselves with countries in the Middle East and elsewhere. And sometimes we did that, uh, even though we had grave concerns about their systems of government, uh, about their, you know, ability to allow uh, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, political participation. So you see here in the upper left-hand corner, Dwight Eisenhower with King Saud, uh, the Saudi king who came to Washington, was eventually deposed. Then to the right, you see Jimmy Carter with Anwar Sadat, the uh, Egyptian uh, military officer who became dictator of Egypt, but is remembered fondly here for making peace with Egypt. In the lower left-hand corner, of course, President Carter with the Shah, uh, who was a modernizing force, who was uh, cooperative with America in most of our geopolitical aims, but had an abysmal human rights record, which ultimately backfired on him. Unless you think this is just a, uh, an Arab or Middle Eastern phenomena, uh, in the lower right-hand corner, uh, you see President Ronald Reagan with Jose Napoleon Duarte, uh, the president of El Salvador. And this was at about the time that um, the Salvadorian uh, forces killed the uh, Archbishop, Blessed Archbishop St. Oscar Romero, uh, the Archbishop of El Salvador, who was uh, murdered while saying mass. So there were a lot of compromises that were done. And basically, the idea was that the United States would engage with these countries in the Middle East. But we were trying to do this uh, and modify them and, you know, and modify their practices and move them towards uh, greater political participation towards the uh, liberal vision of uh, participatory democracy in some state or another. And of course, you know, uh, with Reagan and, and Duarte, that was a constant goal because our goals of, you know, countering this communist insurgency were always set back whenever there were human rights violations. So we had some success with some and some failures with uh, some others, as you see on this slide. Next slide, please. Now, what changed? What changed was the fall of communism, as exemplified by the uh, uh, fall of the Berlin Wall there. You see East German border guards looking across at all these West Germans going, oh my gosh, these people are all wearing Nikes. That looks nice. Uh, that was a, a real critical era in world history. And uh, it led to a moment of hubris because now there was only one model. You were either uh, a Western liberal 
uh, democracy or you were backwards and trying to catch up. And uh, the, that moment, that heady moment was summarized by Francis Fukuyama, uh, who you see here in his quote in the, uh, from the end of history and the last man. Um, of course, he's received a lot of, um, he's come in for a lot of criticism since then. But, uh, you know, at the point, you know, where he spoke, I think he was speaking right. And, uh, you know, for about 20 years, it seemed that the argument was not over what's the best system. It was over how to get people into the system so that they can participate. So um, this was always a problem in the Middle East because, you know, our partners in the Middle East, for the most part, are not democracies. They are generally um, monarchies. Uh, they're ruled by families. They are not places where people have a right to dissent, where they have a right of free speech. They're rather places where when um, rights or when the ability to speak out is granted, it's granted kind of as a privilege from the royal family. It's not like us as Americans where we have the right to do this. <coughs> and so they felt like they were backwards, that they were constantly being told, you know, if you want to have the benefits of association with us, you have to move up. There's something wrong with you. Your system is not where it should be. You need to um, conform to this universal Western liberal democracy. And if you're not doing that, you're behind. Next slide, please. But another model arose, and it arose rather quickly. So, of course, in the upper left-hand corner, you see the still unknown protester in Tiananmen Square against the uh, brutal crackdown by the Chinese Communist Party. We still don't know how many people were killed in that. And in the wake of that, the Chinese government said, we've got to change the way we're doing things. And what they decided to do was to uh, enter into the economic aspects of the liberal order, join the World Trade Organization, uh, things like that, while still keeping uh, a, uh, a close hold on political participation. So they, what they came up with was this weird sort of capitalist authoritarian state. And uh, they determined to participate in all the instruments of globalization and take those, but not subscribe to any of the political liberalization that we in the West, rather foolishly in retrospect, thought was inevitable if you participated in these things. They created an authoritarian model that, as you can see by the chart in the lower right-hand corner, allowed China to acquire an incredible amount of wealth, while at the same time not opening up their political system one iota, not letting up the control of the Chinese Communist Party over every aspect of life that the Chinese Communist Party was interested in. Next slide, please. And the part of the, now this is accelerated in recent years because of the uh, ability of technology and the creation of the surveillance states. So you see surveillance cameras in China on the upper left-hand corner. On the uh, right-hand corner is a visualization of all of the data that can be acquired through this persistent surveillance network. And basically, if you're in the public space in China, you are being watched and observed every time, uh, not just uh, through cameras and static facilities. You go through metal detectors to get on the subway, uh, in times of the Wuhan uh, coronavirus, of course, they are uh, taking temperature scans of people as they get on public transportation or if they enter or leave different cities and provinces. They have things such as facial recognition software, gate recognition software, gate meaning how you walk, um, and of course, uh, cell phone, social media monitoring, things of that nature. And the fact that everybody carries a cell phone is really, really uh, ubiquitous. You know, I mean, uh, most, most people are unaware of just how intrusive uh, modern technology is. If you have a smart TV, uh, when you had those 500 pages of consumer agreement, a lot of those smart TVs allow the television to take a picture at periods of what's on your TV and then send it back to the company for purposes of market research. But who has time to read the 250 pages of legalese? So you have this sort of technological surveillance state that allows for authoritarian control. And in China, of course, that's being uh, conducted through the development of what's called social credit scores, where if they observe you jaywalking, you get a tick on it, and then you're less likely to get a goal. But at the same time, if you look at the lower left-hand corner, they've managed to also develop a real culture of conspicuous consumerism and take advantage of all the benefits of globalism. So here you see Chinese women who have just finished shopping at a Gucci store in China. And you can get everything you want in China. I mean. You know, it is truly part of trading there. And if you have enough money, you can travel all around the world. But at the same time as you've had the surveillance state and you've had this incredible explosion of wealth, 
probably the greatest incident of raising people from poverty to a comfortable existence in one country in history, and access to global consumer markets, you still, the lower right-hand corner, have an absolutely untempered authoritarian state that, if anything, has increased its control. Now, this model of authoritarianism is extremely attractive to countries in the Middle East because finally, after three decades or so of hectoring from the West, saying you have to liberalize, you have to liberalize, it's the only way, it's the only way, they're now able to say, no, there's another model here. This model is authoritarianism, technology enables it, and uh, it's more appropriate for our culture than your model, which is you know, more appropriate for your culture. Next slide, please. And so what we see is in countries in the Middle East, um, they have embraced this sort of uh, model of surveillance, at least. And of course, there hasn't been a significant amount of liberalization, although there has been in recent years, you see social liberalization, things such as women being allowed to drive in Saudi Arabia. So the upper left-hand corner shows a hotel a security uh, place in Abu Dhabi. The middle picture shows an intersection in Abu Dhabi, and the Abu Dhabi police have announced that every, every intersection in Abu Dhabi is under surveillance right now. They use that as a safety measure, but uh, I've seen demonstrations where they show how you know, a car coming in can be tracked and responded to and things of that nature. And uh, even against the most sophisticated threat, this technological network is quite, quite adept. Uh, at uh, identifying things. So the picture in the lower right-hand corner, the uh, gentleman in the large picture was uh, one of Hamas's leaders. He was assassinated in Dubai. Uh, pretty, he was found without marks. It took a, a secondary autopsy to determine that he had in fact been choked. And then the smaller pictures uh, were identified by the Dubai police as members of Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency, who uh, entered the country on false passports. And they were able, in a matter of days, to you know, show these people coming in through the airport, moving around. They were able to identify uh, which documents had been forged, things of that nature. Not only did this lead to, of course, you know, issues between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, which doesn't have formal relations, but some of these passports were Canadian, Irish, Australians. And so that led to... Um, diplomatic issues between those countries and Israel, uh, since they were using uh, false documents from citizens of their states. This is, this sort of espionage trade craft, you, know, you can imagine this in a crime scenario, this sort of thing would have been beyond the reach of most countries in the world, uh, you know, 15 years ago. But uh, the countries in the Middle East are, in, are embracing this technology. And what it shows is that they no longer feel that they have to strive for Western liberalism, as we've been saying in all of our national security documents, but rather that they can embrace this authoritarianism model, be rich, have happy citizens, and not have to uh, go to plural liberalization. So this is probably one of the greatest threats to American interests and American values in the Middle East. And it's a challenge because, you know, it's not something that we're comfortable talking about. And it's, it's not something that you can really um, address on the nuts and bolts basis, because uh, most people just won't talk about it. Next slide, please. Now, coronavirus, how does this affect it? Well, you see a coronavirus in the upper left. In the middle, you see a Chinese uh, police officer taking a uh, heat scan of a person who's probably about to enter a public spot. And then in the bottom, you see a drone also in China that's being used to uh, broadcast messages to say, get off the streets. Historically, uh, public health emergencies have served as the um, impetus, as the spur for a uh, greater government expansion of control and uh, the governments use new techniques to, to control personnels and populations. So we've seen, for example, in Israel, they've used enhanced cell phone tracking to determine if people are lose, leaving their house, if they're in an area where there's high COVID and they've been able to come down and tell them to get back in the house. We're seeing surveillance techniques here that are being developed or deployed for the first time in the coronavirus. And unfortunately, in most countries, once the cat's out of the bag, it's hard to get it back in there. So it'll be used probably, you know, maybe not as ubiquitously as the Chinese Communist Party uses it against its own citizens and particularly against um, ethnic minorities like the Uyghurs or Tibetans, but it will also become part of the standard package of police uh, uh, protection or police uh, measures that we'll see used throughout the Middle East just because, you know, that's kind of the model that people are increasingly looking towards. Next slide. So I'm sorry to end on such a negative note, but I think that part of the key to advancing a Western liberal interest is to recognizing what we're up against. And I haven't seen a really a 
comprehensive discussion of the attraction of authoritarianism in the Middle East and how technology and the COVID enables that. So I wanted to leave on that note and then I'll welcome your questions. Although Patrick knows if it's a really hard question, uh, I break out in tears. So be gentle. Thank you. Well, Professor, uh, Professor DeRose, thank you so much for that. Uh, we now uh, have a, a great baseline for understanding a lot of what goes on in the, uh, the Middle East and in other parts of the world in terms of uh, our global energy supply, what it means uh, to the Middle East region and the, uh, the incidence of authoritarianism and the economic model that uh, China portrays, not just to the Middle East, but to uh, other developing parts of the world. So uh, that was a terrific uh, presentation. Uh, we are going to uh, turn to some questions and we already have at least one hand raised on our uh, Zoom uh, board here. And a reminder for our Facebook Live listeners, if you uh, wanna send your questions, uh, send those to at TNWAC and we'll take those. Uh, before we turn to questions, uh, uh, Dave, let me ask uh, uh, one and, and I'm gonna, uh, during the, the remainder of the time here, intersperse uh, our audience questions with a couple of topics. I'd like to, um, you know, as, as you mentioned at the, uh, the outset, uh, the Middle East is, is a thousand miles wide and maybe we can just get uh, a foot deep in, into a couple of areas. Uh, those in my mind would be what's going on in Iraq. We've, um, we've left, uh, you know, the, the uh, season, fin season finale was in January when uh, the United States uh, killed uh, Qasem Soleimani, the head of the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps in, uh, in Baghdad, and Iran uh, responded with uh, a volley of surface-to-surface uh, -surface missiles against a base in northern uh, Iraq. And uh, the pandemic kind of took the, uh, uh, the headlines away from what's going on in Iraq. But uh, we've seen some Iranian-backed militia activities. President Trump has said that um, if that continued, we were going to uh, follow up the food chain, I think was his uh, terminology, to go from the, uh, the militias to the source of the trouble, which he implied would be Tehran. Uh, the other issue, and, and you can pick these off or uh, dodge them or uh, however you choose to address them, but uh, uh, the second uh, area that I'd like you to touch on is the, uh, the Saudi-Iranian um, correlation of forces and politics and uh, the acrimony mm -hmm. across, uh, across the Gulf. And, and lastly, uh, as far as the questions from me, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, you spent a lot of time uh, in Saudi Arabia. You're, you're uh, very familiar with what's going on in Saudi Arabia, the politics. Uh, you're acutely aware of the, uh, uh, the history and the ongoing relationship that Washington and Riyadh have. So if you could uh, touch on that as well. So if, if you wanna uh, just uh, start with one of those, I'm going to, uh, take a look at the field of questions here and have them teed up for you when uh, you take another pause. Sure, okay, well, let me, let me uh, talk about Iraq then. So Iraq uh, is, is an interesting place and what you've got is a real imbalance there. The United States presence there is expeditionary. It's for a limited purpose. We left the country in 2011. We came back when largely through the mismanagement of the country and the fact that uh, uh, one ethnic group kind of took over government, purged the security forces, and you've got ISIS, which you know, was a significant threat, but was enhanced by the fact that it was a Sunni Muslim group operating primarily in Sunni areas with population that had been completely alienated by the Shia dominated <coughs> security apparatus in there. So it, the, the metaphor is like when the uh, the Dutch, uh, in the face of the Japanese advance in Indonesia, they were facing a Japanese army, true, but they were also facing a native population that was, you know, rising up against them. And so, you know, the government fell. So the United States went back for that. Iran, on the other hand, has never left. And look, Iran views Iraq's uh, role as a province, uh, or maybe not a province, but uh, a less than sovereign state. So what you've seen is Iraq using uh, Shi'i, many of whom were uh, captured during the iran Iraq war, prisoners of war, or who were part of the anti-Saddam Hussein uh, movement, using these people to try to exert control over the Iraqi government. And uh, so when Qasem Soleimani was killed, 
that was significant. But at the end of the day, he's in an organization. He's, he's implementing the strategy of a nation. A deputy moves up. They move on. They might be less effective. What was really important was Abdul Mahdi al Mohandas, who was the deputy commander of the popular militia, which is paid for by the Iraqi state. But he was taking orders from the Iranians. Um, he commanded a group that you know besieged the U.S. embassy. So technically, they're part of the Iraqi security infrastructure, but they don't take orders from Iraq. And um, uh, his death, you know, in, in the past with these Iranian proxies, with this Hezbollah in Lebanon or in, in Iraq, um, once they got a way to weasel into the government, once they established themselves in the government, they had been untouchable. So killing him, I think, is in many ways a little bit more significant than the death of uh, Suleiman Qasim. Suleiman uh, al-Qasim, that seemed to be, Qasim Soleimani, that to me is the um, more significant thing there. So where are we now? Iran wants us out of Iraq, full stop. The Iraqis kind of, you know, most Iraqis uh, want us there because they realize without us, um, you know, Iraq will just be taken over by Iranian interests. And of course, Iran is frustrating Iraq's ability to become economically independent because, you know, they're their major market for uh, electricity. Uh, they use Iraq's dependency on Iran to evade sanctions, things of that nature. So there's all kinds of issues there. Well, we have a question from uh, Betty Bellamy, and we will uh, turn on uh, Betty's. Uh... Betty, are you with us? You. Uh... You can unmute and ask your question. Betty asked, uh, raised her hand to ask a question, and we will uh, we will return to uh, Betty in just a minute, perhaps. Uh, okay. Dave, uh, the the Saudi Iranian uh, uh, mm -hmm. position on on things. Uh, yeah, well, there's there's uh, there's a couple of problems there. So the first one is. Um, you know, Iran is a revolutionary state and the constitution of the revolutionary state of Iran says that it has to be ever expanding, has to do the cost. People think that the phrase IRGC stands for Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, but it actually stands for Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. And right. so it's an open question as to, um, you know, Saudi Arabia sees itself as the leader of the true faith. The king of Saudi Arabia does not sign his letter king. He signs it custodian of the two holy mosques. Um, the religious imprimatur as the guardian of the holy places, Mecca and Medina, is key. It is key to the legitimacy and the continued power of the Saudi state. So they're kind of destined for conflict there. What overlays this is the fact that Iran uh, feels that it has a, um, a right to intervene in any state where there is a Shia population. They see themselves as the global leaders of Shiism regardless of their citizenship, sort of as Putin has asserted for ethnic Russians, wherever they are in the world. And uh, there are Shia in Saudi Arabia. They all live in the Eastern province, which also is where the oil is. So Saudi Arabia um, has in the past with a degree of credibility accused um, Iran of promoting uh, insurgency and separatism in there. And they also see, you know, as Ron is trying to encircle them and cut them off from that. So there's a lot of issues there and they go back centuries. And uh, let's, let's look at uh, the U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia. Mohammed bin Salman, the, uh, the deputy crown prince, a couple of years ago, most of um, the relationships that you and I uh, grew to understand were in a previous uh, reign of uh, mm -hmm. Saudi kings that uh, were not quite um, as easily moved as this current one is by his son, uh, the deputy crown prince, uh, King Abdullah, who uh, who reigned for uh, quite a while uh, in bringing about the current uh, state of development in the, in the kingdom and the relationship with the U.S. through some through some trying times. Um, we we now see a, a total new. Um, cast of uh, actors on the scene and the relationship between Mohammed bin Salman and, and the Trump administration seems to be uh, warm uh, at, a, at least and uh, the Trump administration 
is interested in continuing the arms sales and the current relationship. What's what's your read on uh, on where we are with that relationship and and where yeah. we where we might see things going? Well, you know, Mohammed bin Salman has both the uh, he's consolidated power. He's the crown prince. He's the heir apparent. Uh, his father, King Salman, uh, occasionally intervenes in issues. For example, he he postponed the sell-off of part of Saudi Aramco to raise money. Um, but for the most part, uh, most people think that Mohammed bin Salman runs the kingdom on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, he's young. Uh, he can make decisions. That's both a good thing and a bad thing. In the past, you know, the decisions were made by this consultation of, you know, princes and ministers. And a lot of times it just took forever to get anything out of them. Now he makes decisions. When they're good decisions, that's good. When they're bad decisions, then it's horrible. You know, they, there's no safety net. You just fall all the way down and keep on falling. Um, the Trump administration has embraced uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, recognized our things there. Unfortunately, um, he's done it in such an open way, and he's really um, almost ignored the, you know, we've always said, yes, these are important partners. Yes, we have security interests, economic interests, but we need to promote human rights. And we've put that latter one off the case. Um, so that kind of, um, Americans aren't happy with that, the idea that, you know, we're supporting what is a religious-based absolute monarchy. The second problem is just the polarizing nature of Trump himself. Trump is, um, uh, because he's done this so much, a lot of people in Congress, uh, you know, of both parties, <laughs> who might have been inclined to support the U.S.-Saudi relationship in different aspects on, on pragmatic grounds, now oppose it just because they don't want to give Trump a victory. And uh, the risk for Saudi Arabia is that it may be seen as a Trump pet uh, process and thus has to be opposed as a means of getting back at Trump. So I think the Saudis are, are trying to look for ways to hedge their bets and to get back in the, the mainstream of American political discourse, not to be so closely, not to have their interests so closely tied with one administration. Now, there are uh, still some people who are looking at the, uh, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in, mm -hmm. in Istanbul a couple of years ago as, as a sticking point. Uh, yeah. is, is the relationship moved on past that? Uh, well, the relationship with the administration has, but I think for a lot of Americans, you know, that's going to be that's going to be a problem for a long time. And the Saudis don't really know how to get out of this. Um, uh, at best, uh, this was a Beckett situation where um, you know uh, subordinates uh, were eager to do what they thought the boss. Wanted. At worst, this was uh, a hideous crime directed by the highest levels of government. I can tell you that a lot of people, you know, the uh, you know, of course, to quote uh, Napoleon when he was speaking of another political killing, it was worse than a crime. It was a mistake. I mean, why on earth would you kill a guy who, you know, writes for the Washington Post? You know, it's a newspaper. It's the second most influential newspaper in the country. It's owned by the richest man in the world. They're not going to let that go. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a constant irritant. But, you know, when you look at some of the other things that have happened, uh, you know, France uh, blowing up the Rainbow Warrior, you know, they killed a person in New Zealand. Uh, they uh, lied about, uh, they said that they would incarcerate their naval commanders who did this if New Zealand handed them over. They did, and then they set them free and gave them awards. Um, you know, we didn't, we didn't break relations with France. That was, that was a murder, too. Um, you know, the, the, eventually, I'm sure... The affairs of politics will will rise to the rise to the forefront, but I don't think they're going to do it while Donald Trump's president because he's seen as inadequately pursuing this. So this will always be there. Sure. And quite frankly, uh, in the internet age where people are doing this, and the fact that it was Washington Post and so closely to that—I mean, I knew Jamal and I really liked him. Um, I think, for example, you know, you're not going to see a state visit uh, by Mohammed bin Salman in my lifetime. Yeah, there are some of those. I, I knew Jamal for about 20 years, uh, and and there were some of us who really, uh, it's it's a bitter pill watching this not not getting any uh, any more resolution than we've already seen. Well, we have a, yeah. a question from Jim Shepard, and we're going to uh, turn on uh, Jim. Are you with us? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Good. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? 
Uh, just a follow-up question, kind of on along the lines of what you were just talking about, uh, but looking at it from an internal Saudi perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, MBS has made a couple of uh, pretty bad calls. Uh, Jamal certainly was one. The oil price war with Russia is another. Internally, he's taken a lot of steps to try to control the situation and, and take away his uh, potential uh, heirs. How do you see this playing out from an internal Saudi perspective? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, he has moved against uh, potential rivals in the royal family and elsewhere uh, much more quickly and much more um, uh, decisively than any of the smart people who look at Saudi Arabia would have predicted. Um, honestly, there's been um, a surprisingly muted response within Saudi Arabia. And I think uh, folks realize that, you know, who the king is uh, doesn't really uh, make that much difference in their day-to-day -day lives. They don't really, you know, they're not vested in one faction versus the other. It doesn't really matter. What matters is uh, what kind of, you know, are they going to have jobs? Are they going to have opportunities? Uh, you know, will they be able to live a, a decent life and have respect for themselves? And so far, uh, Mohammed bin Salman allows, you know, he has the vision of that happening, of a economy being transformed. Um, and Saudi Arabia is drastically different from what it was two years ago. Uh, you see more women uh, out in public, uh, the religious police who used to, you know, hit people with bamboo, you know, women if their wrists were exposed or whatever, they're not out anymore. Uh, you see uh, a lot more public participation. There's public entertainment. And uh, there is still the promise of a world in which, of a kingdom in which uh, your ability to make a success of yourself doesn't stem from your proximity to power, having connections or getting licenses, but rather from hard work. So it's still pretty attractive for them. And what happens at the royal family, you know, and who, which prince does what, that's, that's not a not a day-to-day -day issue. They don't care about that as long as you know, you have some idea of transparency and, and uh, you know, it's important to note too, you know, I mean, like the princes in the Ritz Carlton. Yeah, a lot of those guys, you know, were conducting business in manners that would be unacceptable in the United States or in a Western country. So I think, I think uh, a lot of average studies, when they saw that, they said, good, about time somebody reigns this soon. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, we'll... Uh, Move on to our next question from, it comes from uh, Campbell Lehman, who uh, is one of our students in our WorldQuest competition. And uh, uh, Academic WorldQuest is part of our education outreach program that we do with high, with, uh, high school level uh, students. And uh, Campbell asks, um, has COVID affected the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, particularly in Jerusalem? I know uh, there's there's been some reporting on impacts across the Arab world. Um, where where uh, do you see the COVID-19 pandemic mm -hmm. affecting uh, situations in the Middle East, especially as Campbell asks in, uh, in the Palestinian uh, situation? Yeah. Well, thank thanks for the question, Campbell. That's a good one. I, I um, talked about this about a week ago. I gave a talk at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. And uh, I think the real impact is going to be uh, when all is said and done, when you look at the countries that whose support is critical for Israel, and most notably the United States and others. And basically you have four populations within Israel. So you've got uh, Jewish Israelis, you've got uh, Israeli Arabs, and that includes Jerusalem. You've got uh, uh, people on the West Bank, and then you've got people in Gaza. When all is said and done, if there is a gross disparity in treatment, death rates, access to hospitals, in any four of those, that will lessen the support outside of Israel for the Israeli government. That will be seen as, uh, you know, sort of health insecurity being caused by a lack of democratic participation. So uh, the last data point, I don't make a close study of Israel, but the last data point I looked at was uh, Arab hospitals in Jerusalem were reporting that they were running out of resources, running out of beds. So if you have a situation where it's known that there's surplus capacity, say in the Jewish community uh, in mainland Israel, but there's uh, you know people dying on the floor in hospitals in Gaza, that is not going to be good for Israel. Um, now, to be to to be blunt about this, 
Israel knows this, you know, the Israeli authorities know this better than I do. And uh, I'm pretty sure, you know, we haven't seen the kind of stories about inequities and treatment and stuff that we have there, but uh, there is a potential there. And, and really it, 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 it runs the risk of playing into a narrative that is hostile to Israel, that I think really does threaten Israel, which is uh, based on demographics saying that Israel is becoming an apartheid state. Israel doesn't want that, doesn't need that, and anything that hints on that, they will take great steps to move away because they think that that's, uh, that, that really is an existential threat to support for the state. Well, any more uh, questions from our attendees? We'll, uh, we'll entertain maybe one or two more. Uh, Dave, while we uh, wait to see if there are any, do you have, uh, uh, and I'm gonna, as I mentioned before we started, uh, ask you a question about uh, more on a, a global scale of uh, what we can expect to see uh, post pandemic as, uh, as we see what uh, is expected to be a transformation in the global landscape. But before we do that, uh, having seen no new questions, I'll uh, ask you if you have any closing comments about the Middle East. Um, uh, what, uh, what would you like to leave us with about the area of your expertise? <laughs> well, actually, things are not as bad as people think. Uh, if, if you uh, look at the Middle East, uh, starting from when it was first defined as a geographic area in the popular consciousness, which is immediately in the wake of World War II, it's always been an area in turmoil. It's always been an area in crisis. There's always something coming and going. And there still will be problems. The major drives of instability are the uh, Syrian civil war, uh, of course, the Iranian uh, uh, infiltration, and, and uh, uh, really uh, the undermining of the Iraqi government and its ability to do anything. Uh, and then, of course, poverty and inequity that you see um, in Yemen, in Sudan, in Egypt, in uh, um, the demographic pressures are real. They're going to they're gonna have to be dealt with. But at the end of the day, uh, what's really remarkable is just the ability of people there to uh, persevere and to adapt in ways that can't be done. Egypt is a desperately poor country. They managed to accomplish this incredibly complex widening of the Suez Canal in record time in the last few years. Um, there, there's always the ability to do that. So I would just say that if you look at the region, it's easy to get mired in gloom and doom and all that, but um, the worst predictions never quite come to play. We usually see problems that we haven't expected, but the worst case scenario rarely comes to play there. And, and at the end of the day, I, I, I believe that we will see, you know, nobody predicted the uh, Israel-Egyptian peace. Uh, there's the possibility for something there uh, in the few years, but there's going to be some tough sledding, particularly in Syria and Yemen. Sure. Now, now to the last question, uh, leaving the, the Middle East, uh, we're in the middle of uh, quite a catastrophic situation here in terms of a, a global mm -hmm. pandemic. And a lot of people were already starting to uh, cool a little bit on the concept of globalization. Uh, yeah. International trade uh, got beat up a little bit. Uh, international institutions were uh, sort of uh, falling prey to a lot of rhetorical attacks. The mm -hmm. president went to the United Nations and uh, castigated the uh, globalists and said he was a nationalist. So now that we uh, have come up against a, a global crisis uh, that is likely to transform uh, all of these institutions and, and the global landscape, what what kinds of things would you uh, want us to be thinking about it as we come to grips with what the world is going to look like on the other side. Right. Well, I think that this this idea of complex global interdependence, people have realized that um, you've had a, 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 a worldwide regime of global free trade, but not every country who is involved in that regime actually believes in global free trade, So, uh, particularly China. So I think what you're going to see is um, uh, sort of an introduction of industrial policy in a lot of the Western democracies where they're going to say, look, we can't rely on just in time. We can't rely on foreign sources for things. They're going to try to identify key sectors uh, of their economy, pharmaceuticals, um, things of that nature, and less interdependence. And we've seen that already in the European Union, you know, the supposedly Schengen zone, which is supposed to be border free. France has reimposed its borders. So I think there will be uh, a step backward on that. And I think there will also, 
this is what's forward is I think people are going to say, look, if you're going to take part in international institutions, and here I'm sympathetic towards the president, you know, if the United States pays 16% of the budget of WHO, we shouldn't have smoke blown up our kilt and, you know, be fed false figures uh, about, uh, you know, pandemic diseases and have the head of the organization say, this stuff can't be transmitted from humans to humans when there's evidence that says it shouldn't. So I'm always in favor. I, I think that every government organization uh, could always use an occasional hostile audit. Um, you know, every army unit needs a, a visit from the inspector general just to tighten their shot group. And uh, I don't see why that doesn't apply to international organizations as well. But, um, you know, when all said and done, uh, with this president, he's not a politician. He doesn't speak in measured terms. He's a businessman. And they threaten, they dissemble, they raise their voice and thump their hand on the table. Um, they say things that they don't believe just to see what the reaction is. Uh, you know, it would be a mistake to, to judge uh, a businessman's pronouncements by the um, standards of normal uh, politicians and diplomats. And uh, I think that... Uh, you know, we're not going to see a collapse of the world order, but there will be some retrenchment, some uh, evaluation of what a state really needs to function. Well, great. Uh, Professor David DeRoche, the uh, Near East uh, South Asia Center, National Defense University, thank you so much for spending your Tuesday evening with us and helping us uh, get a better understanding of what's going on in uh, the Middle East. Thank you, Pat. It's an honor. Uh, this has been uh, the Global Dialogue, uh, our speakers program uh, from the Tennessee World Affairs Council. Uh, we look forward to having you back uh, at our next episode, which will be in two weeks. Uh, next week, uh, this time slot will be Global Nashville with uh, Carl Dean. He'll be talking to Sean Henry, the president of the Nashville Predators. And you can also look for uh, our afternoon program, two o'clock, uh, Ambassador Dick Bowers and I talking about uh, current events. Uh, we have a lot of uh, new video programs that uh, you can enjoy. So take a look at tnwac.org and uh, you'll be able to uh, keep up with what's going on. Again, uh, Professor Dave DeRoche, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate uh, you spending time with us. Thanks, Pat.